it's seven o'clock. You're watching Sky News Breakfast, coming to you live from Buckingham Palace. The country and the Commonwealth are waking up to the first day with a newly crowned king and queen. Tens of thousands joined in the historic events with pageantry and some protests, red arrows and rainfall. Prince William posted a behind the scenes video of his family writing, what a day. Thank you to everyone who made it happen. And the lady with the sword, Penny Mordaunt, says she practiced for the coronation by doing press ups. And today the celebrations continue as thousands of street parties are planned across the country. Well, we'll hear from some of the people hoping to party again like it's 1953. Plus, we'll have a full roundup of how the papers are reporting the King's big day. Hello, a very good morning. Britain is waking up with a newly crowned king and queen. If the enduring images of the coronation will be the splendid and sometimes strange ceremony at Westminster Abbey, today is about what's happening in communities across the country. Hundreds of thousands of people are expected to take part in street parties and what's been called a nationwide big lunch. And then tonight, there'll be a star-studded concert at Windsor Castle, including Lionel Richie and Katy Perry. Well, more on all of that in a moment, but first, our home editor, Jason Farrell, reflects on an historic day. Emerging from an ancient ceremony into a modern world, the crowned King Charles III and waiting for him in the 260-year-old gold state coach, his queen, the title held by his mother, now his wife's. Even with eight horses, the four-ton gilded carriage can only be pulled at walking pace. But majesty is, in part, about being magical, and it seems there are millions captivated by it. be it the fairy tale carriages or the splendor of a 4000 strong military parade or the family saga the embarrassing uncle on parade and rebel son now best selling author pitching up without his wife and the coach carrying the dutiful future heirs to the throne it is soap opera mixed with the opera of royal pageantry. An elected official couldn't do what they do. It's just so perfect. Their allure, just it's fairy tale. It brings everybody together, there's unity, it's a sort of a, it's the proudness of being British. It's it's that's what the monarchy is all about. Thousands have come here just to be in touching distance of history. Because of course a coronation is something we've not experienced in decades, but for that same reason, it's left others asking whether we've moved on from what it represents. <laughs> there was a zone set aside for protesters, but some mixed with the royalists on the Mall. <laughs> One here arrested for bringing a megaphone that police said may have spooked the horses. I feel strongly that we should have, we should elect any head of state or any anybody with any ceremonial responsibility and we've got a wonderful country full of talented people who who aren't who don't inherit privilege and wealth but most came here to revel in a legacy they don't want to end earlier watching on a giant screen in st james's park the moment the king was crowned but invited to pledge allegiance i swear that i will pay to no one had the words to hand except this bit your allegiance? Oh yes, I pledged my allegiance a long time ago. I think it's just an absolutely incredible moment, uh, one that I'm glad I got out of bed for in the morning to come and witness. What a historic day, absolutely fantastic. You know, long live King Charles III. Makes you proud to be British? I love what he does for the country, I love the royal family first off, and I think 
we need continuity and we need somebody who can represent everything about the traditions of this country. There is continuity, but unfamiliarity too, in seeing a man so many years a prince, now head of state, head of the Church of England and head of the armed forces. Three cheers for His Majesty the King and Her Majesty the Queen. Hep, hep. Hooray! Hep, hep. Hooray! Hep, hep. Hooray! Saluted by those who serve under him in Buckingham Palace Gardens. His authority rests on regimented formality and the passion of the public. And whether they connect with him. Certainly, there was a rush on the Mall for the best view of the finale. But in some ways, the endurance of the last monarch makes this rebirth harder. Her absence still felt as the king appeared on this balcony for the first time ever without his mother. Instead, a blended family, grandchildren from both sides taking centre stage. Notably missing one brother and one son. These are the faces of the future, the working royals, and those who are next in line to take on this role. Unlike royal occasions we're used to, such as weddings and jubilees, this is not just a celebration, but a day to affirm the majesty of one man. The late queen described the imperial crown resting on Charles's head as unwieldy. Now he will know what it's like to wear it. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Well, I have with me two people who enjoyed yesterday enormously, the author and historian Sir Anthony Selden and the royal commentator Viscountess Hinchinbrook, uh, better known to many as Julie Montague. So welcome back to both of you. Um, Anthony Selden, King Charles waking up this morning, how will he be feeling, do you think? How will he be looking back on yesterday? I'd imagine that he would think, what a great day that was. That, thank goodness, nothing went wrong, but also an awful lot went right. And the, the reception has been very positive. He was, it was a very difficult challenge because he had to modernise the coronation 70 years ago. Britain was still a great imperial power, a very different country. It was still very white, still very monoculture. Uh, there was a much greater sense of deference and respect for the royal family and from aristocracy. Uh, it was a, so different. And if he modernised it too far, he could have lost his core base. So it was a much more modern, inclusive, much fairer representation of Britain today. For some people, didn't go far enough. For some, too far. But I think he would have felt, got it just about right. All went off beautifully. He didn't drop anything. <laughs> yeah. Nobody dropped anything. And there were no bad incidents. You know, that's a huge worry for the security services, always, with an event like this. I mean, unlike... The funeral, when if people had bad intentions, they'd have had little time to plan for it. Everyone knew that it was happening today. So, I mean, a fantastic effort from the security side, the hidden side, the people we never see, but an amazing uh, effort by the British state, too, to put Britain on at its most historic and best. And, and the music, sublime. Yeah, and 12 newly composed pieces as well oh, yeah. in the service, all of it very, very beautiful. And Julie, do you agree that the balance that was struck was about right, of ancient and modern, in terms of appealing to people, making them feel that it was relevant but also extraordinary? And, and, and what will they have made it as it was beamed around the world? I, I think at first, when, you know, word came out that peers would not be invited um, apart from a ballot system, so they wouldn't be wearing their robes or their coronets. I think, of course, there was some, I think, disappointment, but he did get it right. You know, I look at the family that I married into, and it was Edward Montague, the first Earl of Sandwich, who brought back Charles II from exile to then be crowned in 1661. And there has been an Earl of Sandwich uh, in my husband's family attending coronations since 1661, 
until yesterday. My father-in-law wasn't invited, we weren't invited, and that is the right thing to do. And But instead, two of our farmers were invited, and we know that uh, King Charles uh, started in 2010, the Prince's Countryside Fund, and he has a, you know, a huge hand in helping sort of local farmers, smaller farmers, um, with advice and with grants, and that was represented yesterday. So it was wonderful to see that, it, again, it was much more inclusive, and I think that was the right tone to take. So more inclusive, Julie, but, but what about the, the spectacle of the regalia, of, the, of those ancient traditions? What do people make of it abroad? What do people make of it in your, in your home country of America? Well, nobody does it better, ceremony or pageantry or rituals better than the Brits, and so we still got all that. You know, we saw the St. Edward's crown, we saw the Imperial State crown, and we, we saw the orb, the scepter, the robe. So it was still spectacular. You know, there were bits that were missing, but then there were other bits that were added that really emphasized how different of coronation this is. And, it, and that was wonderful to see. And as you mentioned, the music was spectacular. The, and it went out, you know, went off without a hitch. And that, I think, was the most important uh, and wonderful to see. And uh, Auntie, you refer to the fact that on a security front, things went smoothly. As you say, a huge relief. But there were protests. Mm -hmm. There will also have been a lot of people that weren't interested, you know, yeah. not just actively protesting, but just not interested at all. How much of that uh, represents a challenge for King Charles to, to, to keep the monarchy relevant in his reign? Well, absolutely. It's a huge challenge and the work really does begin for him now. How is he going to show uh, all young people, all those uh, who, who just couldn't care less about it? And there were large, large numbers who were doing other things. I walked back uh, yesterday and was surprised by how busy Victoria Station was in London, how many people, this was during the service, who really didn't seem to have any interest in it at all. How can uh, the royal family show in an age of democracy? I mean, 1953, everyone kind of got the monarchy and, and they, the war, Second World War had just been over and very prominent role from uh, George VI during that as G George V in the First World War. Now you can't take that for granted. And in a democracy, what do young people think? They think, OK, we've got a prime minister, we get that, we've got parliament MPs, what is the monarch? Uh, what does the head of state do? And I think they have to show that the, uh, the, the sense of the continuity of the royal family and the issues that Charles believes in, like the environment, which he's championed almost better than anybody, that you know, some, there's an ongoing role for the royal family which looks after the country, whichever party is in power, a sense of continuity. OK, and um, we will talk to you again in, in, in terms of continuity. We will be talking to you again a, a little <laughs> later on. But for the moment, Anthony and Julie, thanks very much indeed. So let's take a look at how the newspapers are reporting the coronation this morning. And uh, Crowning Glory is the headline in The Sun on Sunday. The paper writing that a glorious moment of history was captured. The Sunday Mirror has a picture of the king carrying the orb and the scepter. Whilst the star leads with the same picture from the ceremony. The Sunday Express pictures the king waving with the headline, Happy and Glorious. The Mail on Sunday has a photograph of the king and queen together on the Buckingham Palace balcony with a caption, the look that says, Darling, it was a triumph. And the same image makes the front of the Sunday Times, their headline, At Last, Their Crowning Glory. The Sunday Telegraph also features a picture of the royal couple, both wearing crowns from the ceremony. The Sunday People devotes its whole front cover to a picture of King Charles waving. And the Observer pictures the King on the front, but it leads with analysis of Thursday's local election results. Now, the Prince and Princess of Wales have released a video of their coronation day with the caption, What a Day. It includes some behind the scenes footage which was published on their Instagram account and they added a message which said thank you to everyone who made it happen. And if one photo perhaps may become symbolic of yesterday's historic events, it might be this one. The King and Queen on the balcony of Buckingham Palace as an enormous crowd looks back at them. Wearing their crowns, King Charles III and Queen Camilla went out for a final encore together. 
And the Red Arrows have tweeted cockpit video showing what it's like to be involved in an RAF fly past. Nine Red Arrows took part in what was a scaled back fly past because of the weather. More than 60 aircraft were meant to be involved, but in the end they were just 25. Well, tonight, the King and Queen will join 20,000 members of the public at a coronation concert at Windsor Castle. Amongst the stars will be performing are Lionel Richie and Katy Perry, who are at the coronation service. Well, the coronation celebrations do continue today with street parties and community events taking place across the country. So let's find out a little bit more about them. Our correspondent Alice Porter is in the Mal for us this morning. And Alice, tell us a little bit more about what's uh, being planned for today then. Well, I think we can expect lots of bunting, jelly and cream teas as people from around the UK will very much all come together. We're expecting more than 67,000 people. Lunches are being held across the bank holiday weekend, including what's being called a big knees up at London's Regent's Park. Members of the royal family are also getting involved. Uh, Edward and Sophie will attend a street party at Cranley in Surrey, while Princess Anne will drop in on a party in Swindon. And it's understood that the Prime Minister will also be hosting a big lunch at uh, Downing Street with Ukrainian refugees and volunteers who will be there as well. And very much the idea of this is to have communities come together. There'll be many charities who will use these lunches as a way of raising important money. And I think very much the atmosphere that uh, the Royal Family will be wanting to emanate is what we saw last year at the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations, where we saw street parties across the countries with people very much coming together. Of course, this will be the first time that this sort of street parties uh, of people coming across together in the communities, uh, sharing sort of sandwiches and uh, a, few, a few bits of bubbly as well. Uh, this will be the first time that this has happened really uh, since the Queen passed away last year. So it will be very much uh, a moment for the King and the country to come together uh, to celebrate the bank holiday weekend. Lovely. Alice, uh, we'll be checking in on you uh, throughout the day, but for the moment, thanks very much indeed. So there'll still be plenty of bunting and beer today as people across the country get together. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit more about what's planned. Uh, Lindsay Brummett is the programme director at Eden Project Communities. That's the charity behind the big lunch idea. So just the person to talk to, Lindsay. Nice to see you this morning. Good morning. Um, so the big lunch is going to be a focus of many communities up and down the country, but it was originated by the, uh, the Eden Project, wasn't it? Yes. So tell us a little bit about its history, how it came to life. Yeah, so way back in 2009, it's an idea from Eden that it's just about getting people together. So what could happen if you get people together right across the country on one weekend of the year, having food, sharing friendship, and let's see what happens. And actually, from the very first year, it's grown and grown and grown, and so many great things flow from it. So Eden is kind of a movement of people want to make positive change, and the Big Lunch is an extension of that. What we see is communities getting together, uh, joining in, having fun, getting to know one another, and then they go on to do so many more things, like fundraising babysitting circles, borrowing drills instead of buying them, all the good things that can, can help communities knit together. Well, yes, and, and as you say, all about bringing communities together, but the royal family have been involved in it as well, haven't they? I think the Queen Consort has, has yes. been to a few events. She has been to many events, and um, she uh, is our patron, so we're very pleased we've been working with her since 2013, when we did uh, the first... Uh, big jubilee lunch so yeah she's been involved for many years and is really passionate about seeing people come together and enjoy those celebrations and i I, th I understand though that the king and queen won't be involved in any of the big lunch events today is that disappointing or completely understandable given oh i think if i'd <laughs> done the day they did yesterday. yesterday yeah i think i'd be relaxing with a cup of tea and watching the nation take part so i think that's the really lovely thing it's happening everywhere it's right from the shetland isles down to the silly isles we've got big lunches happening in so many communities so i think they'll just enjoy sitting back and watching what's going on. Well, yes, yeah, so what do you make of the take-up? Because I think people do register, don't they, and, and let you know that it's going on. So, so what kind of uh, scale are they on? And, well. and do, they, do they reach far and wide? Or are there certain areas that are more interested? Uh, no, they reach far and wide. I mean, uh, in a normal year, so we, when we haven't got some sort of royal uh, occasion to, to be part of, uh, we'd see about six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 pack requests. This year, we've got 67,000 pack requests. So that's a lot of events right across the country. We've also had some from overseas. So we've got people taking part in about 36 different countries, I think. So um, we're very excited to see um, how that all unfolds today. And when people do apply to do it, 
what do you think they want? Do you think it's about an excuse to get together with their neighbours or do you think it really is about celebrating the royal family? How much connection do you think it really has got to the coronation? Um, I think there's a real mix. So I think some people do it every year and have been coming together just because they want to get their no to know their neighbours better or want to raise money for something that matters to them. And uh, other people are going, actually, this is a chance for a right royal knees up. So we've got everything in the mix. We've got people doing dog shows. We've got people doing fancy dress parades. And I think that's the wonderful thing about it. And the National Lottery fund it. And I think that's because it is an excuse to invite the nation to come together for a party. But the good things flow from that party. And what about what's on the menu? Will the coronation quiche pop up at all, do you think? Because oh, this, sure this is the recipe selected by the royal family, yes, wasn't it? Um, it is. And it's a spinach and butter bean quiche? Is that the It's one? broad bean, spinach broad bean. and tarragon, yes. So there have been lots of comments about the ingredients. Very seasonal. Uh, we have a giant one down at the Eden Project today. So a 32 inch uh, giant coronation quiche going there. So there will definitely be some quiche available. Do you think today. there's going to be more coronation chicken, though, be honest? Um, I prefer. Oh, I haven't tried the quiche, actually, but I love coronation chicken, so I imagine that will also be featuring heavily. I just think it will be. Anyway, Lindsay Brummett, really interesting to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed Thank for coming along. Thank you very along. much. Well, the UK is waking up with a newly crowned king and queen. Thousands of street parties are expected to take place across the country today, which for some people will evoke happy childhood memories of the last coronation in 1953. Shiggy Marariki reports now from Settle in Yorkshire. It was all, all in the market square. Oh, hundreds of people stood down that side, more or less where the middle of the road is, going up here between the white li uh, yellow lines. So quite an event, really, uh, 1953. I think it brought all your community together. You, you never were really split up. What denomination you were, what age you were, you were all brought together and you all celebrated it from youngsters right up to grandparents' age, so it was well, well attended. On the day millions will mark the crowning of a new monarch in their local communities, John can remember the same moment 70 years ago. He was part of a parade in his home of Settle, North Yorkshire, winning first prize for his costume. Nana Raid, uh, my dad's mum, she made the costume out of uh, any sort of material that she had available uh, and was suitable. After another milestone in British history, he thinks protecting and preserving our links to the past are important. It's bringing all your memories back and you can share uh, that day with whoever you're talking to. When our family come up and our grandchildren and they say, what did you do when you did so so, Grandad? And I say, well, just a minute, we'll get the photograph out and I'll show you so I can pass information on to another two generations down. There are not a lot of people living locally who actually will remember these events. So it's nice to have it documented. In these communities, they've long celebrated jubilees and coronations. For a king well known as a champion of the countryside, they want those traditions to continue. The best one from 1935, I think, showing the, the banner there, God bless our king. First made for George V, for the last 70 years, these banners were used for the Queen in nearby Lancliffe. Now, the original wording is back on display. I was blown away by them because I just think they're, they're, they're so wonderful, really, that we've still got them um, after all this time. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a sense of time very much in those photos. And, and now, I suspect, yes, we will celebrate, but it won't, it, it's, it's not going to be on the same scale, I'm afraid. We're not, uh, not doing so much. However people choose to celebrate, stories from this weekend will be told for generations to come. Shingi Marike, Sky News, North Yorkshire. Well, Charles was always destined to be king, but how did that influence his childhood? Well, Johnny Stoneborough attended Gordonston School with King Charles, and he's here with me now. So, very good morning to you. Thanks so good much morning. for coming along. So, you were at Gordonston in, in Northern Scotland uh, yeah. with uh, King Charles when he was a boy. So Yeah, we did four years together. Four years together. So, what was he 60 like? 60 years ago. It's yeah. a long time, isn't it? Yeah. What was he like? Well, when I first met him, he was shy, introverted, very withdrawn, and it didn't get any much better because he got so badly bullied at the beginning. I think the first two years were hell for him, actually. Well, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. He really well, did Well, I get mean, Gordonston, on, you he? know, there wasn't exactly a great deal of pastoral care. They didn't know about those sort of things, and it was very monastic, and you were just told to get on with it, not complain, and the whole stiff upper lip business, you know, make a man. 
of you. But actually, if you're being bullied, which is what was happening to him, um, it's very difficult to cope with, and he didn't really have any friends. If you were, if you tried to be friends with him, and many people did, because he's he's a very nice chap, actually, once you get to know him. Um, but, you know, they got bullied for trying to be friends with 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 our future king, or the king, and uh, so it was a ridiculous situation. Was that why he was bullied, because he was the future king? I don't know. I think there was just a sort of institutionalised bullying anyway, just as sort of the, the, the senior boys would, would have a crack at the, at the juniors and they'd come rampaging like a sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, like sort of Mongol hordes, I don't know, through the dormitories, tip everybody out of bed, shove you into a, um, a laundry basket, leave you under the cold shower. Uh, I mean, you know, it was a wild place. Yeah, horrendous. <laughs> he did have one friend, though, didn't he? He had his bodyguard. Oh, Sergeant Green. We liked Sergeant Green. Yes, he was a London copper and he was his bodyguard. But he got fired, unfortunately. It was an absolute tragedy. It, it, the, uh, that was the famous cherry brandy incident. And, and um, as a result, his, his detective was fired. But, of course, he was his, his one confidant. R remind us what the cherry brandy oh, incident yeah. was. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, God. They went, uh, they, they were sailing. The school did a lot of sailing and they went out to Stornoway uh, in the Western Isles. They went to the Crown Hotel. Uh, in Stornoway. Uh, they could have gone to the cinema, but they didn't. Uh, they were about 14 or 15. I wasn't along on that particular cell. And uh, they they decided, they, everyone was asked what they wanted to drink. You know, young Prince Charles hadn't got a clue what he wanted to drink. So he, he was said, 14, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he was 14. So he said, I'll have a cherry brandy. I wish he, to, you know, to this day, he probably wishes he'd asked for a pint of lager or at least a shandy. And uh, it was it just went viral. It went completely, totally viral. Somebody shopped him to the to, to the tabloids. It was all over the, the papers. Uh, but the, the collateral damage was Sergeant Green lost his job and the prince lost his only friend. He lost his confidence. Yeah. Uh, one sort of happier image that you have is you, you actually dance with him. Yeah, you? <laughs> it's tough, doesn't it? Yeah, there were, there were no women at Gordon's in this sort of monastic environment, but they used to try and sort of uh, tr tr train you a little bit to, you know, cope with the real world. And so we had dancing classes, very specifically Highland dancing classes. So we would just be paired off together um, and do the whole kind of, you know, that business. Yeah. And your wife likes to tell the story. Yeah, my of... wife my wife is, <laughs> is amused, but, you know, she married the man who danced with the Prince of Wales. Yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely. I love, I love that twist on it. Yeah. Uh, so what you know about him as a child, to what extent do you think his experiences at school have informed how he is today? Well, I, I mean, I'll tell you, you know, there's no way that you go through that without uh, without it damaging you. There's, the, the, you know, being badly bullied is a very, very isolating and painful experience, as many people would tell you. One of the positive things, I, I think, is that maybe there are children out there now who are being bullied, and to know that the King of Britain, you know, also was quite badly bullied, uh, maybe that gives them a little bit of strength. You can get through it, but at the time, you, you know, it's awful. And do you think that affects how he deals with other people? Do you think he yeah. has more empathy yes, a, as a result? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure that his interest in, his, in, in people uh, and his, his, his natural concern about, about the natural world, about, about the environment, about people and, and people's lives. You know, I think if he'd gone to a different school, he maybe would have been more, more distant, more removed from the real world. Gordon sort of at least gave him that. And, and, and what about his dealing with challenges, that sense of uh, never explain, never complain? Yeah. That, that came from those early days? Well, we were all brought extent? up very much on the never complain, never explain sort of rule of life. Um, the stiff upper lip, it was very much the, that was what we were told, just get on with it. And of course, his father would have understood that. You know, I'm sure that uh, I, I wasn't party to any conversations, but I'm sure that his father would have just said, just, you know, be a man, get on with it. And finally, your thoughts on seeing him crowned yesterday. Oh, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. I sat there because I, of course, remember the previous one. And we sat in front of a little tiny television. Uh, a little black and white one, had all the neighbours round, and yesterday was no different. We had all the neighbours round. The telly's a bit bigger, and it's colour, of course, but it was just <laughs> the same, yeah. Oh, well, Johnny Stainborough, really interesting to, to get your yeah. um, your analysis of, 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 of yesterday, but also to tell us a little bit about uh, King Charles, the boy. Um, oh, thank really you, interesting. Sir. Thanks so much for your yeah. time. Thank you. See. Time now to delve into the Sunday papers, see how they're covering the coronation this morning. Here with me to look at them are Ian Lloyd, a royal biographer and author of The Throne, 1,000 years of British coronations and journalist 
Afia Hagen. So welcome back to both of you. Uh, we Morning. dealt with all the front pages, dominated, as you would imagine, uh, by yesterday's big event, of course. But uh, let's take a look further in, shall we? Ian, you picked out a double-page spread to, to kick us off. And uh, this is this extraordinary photograph. I certainly have never seen a photo from uh, a previous coronation. There's probably not very many that were photographed, but mm. um, I haven't seen quite anything quite like this. What do you make of it? Well, it's it's fascinating because it shows the king and queen and the people together so it's taken by chris jackson from inside the palace as you said um the one unknown factor about the coronation well any big thing a jubilee or a royal funeral or wedding is the people because you don't know who's going to turn up i mean i i, I expected fewer and i also expected that there may be demonstrators down here with you know that we don't want to this king or whatever it is, not uh, our king. Among, yeah. not our king. Um, but it was. I was with the crowd down there. I moved down the mile, and it was universally euphoric. And in the rain. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. The only chant I heard was "Put your brollies down, put your oh, brollies yes, down," yeah, because the people at the front had their umbrellas. So, uh, once that was sorted out, then it was fine, and there was lots of cheering, spontaneous three cheers. And you know, one one un unusual thing I've covered about. Um, 20 of these big occasions is I've never seen the monarch go in and then come out and that's what Charles did they all went in they came out en masse and then he came out finally with just Camilla with um, a bit of an encore yeah a sort of an encore and I think that was because he was incredibly moved by it I mean I was near enough with a big lens to see that he was very affected by it and I think uh, and also really interesting just to see that picture and and the back of both of them a reminder that the queen was crowned as well as the king yesterday and that's obviously something that we certainly didn't see in 1953 in the same way no absolutely i mean prince philip had really a walk on part there was no constitutional role for him as a consort but uh the last time was 1937 so there's hardly anybody that can remember that and that was the uh, his grandparents the king george and queen elizabeth um, and there's a sort of similarity. I mean, the, 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 you know, if you look at that, the, the, the capes and the crowns, obviously, I mean, they're very much a team. And some of the photographs have shown them talking to each other. And you get that feeling that... Uh, yeah, from the day. Together. Yes, absolutely. Um, take us, Afi, into the Sunday Express now, yes. because uh, while the, this was a, a formal event, the service, mm -hmm. uh, full of tradition, there yep. was also the family element as well. And, of course, yes. uh, Prince Harry was, was one of those uh, tricky issues that the, 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 the family had to navigate. So, so, yeah. so how does the Express deal with this, the Sunday a Express? Absolutely. So Harry did attend. There was rumours flying around on Friday that he may not be there, but, of course, he was there. Um, he entered Westminster Abbey with Beatrice and Eugenie, his cousins, um, Zara and Mike Phillips as well, uh, Mike Tyndall and Zara, Phillips, excuse me, um, and he walked down the aisle into the church, into Westminster Abbey with them, was seated in the third row, um, and he looked quite happy, quite relaxed. He was smiling to people as he went past, greeting people. Uh, the lip readers have been out in force already, <laughs> God bless them. Apparently at one point he said about a quarter to four o'clock to someone, and they've interpreted that as perhaps that was his flight, because after the service finished at Westminster Abbey, he was straight into a car and straight to Heathrow Airport, uh, into the Windsor Suite and off back to LA for his son's birthday. Um, you know, he did join in with saying, God save the King and long live King Charles. Um, yeah, and he just seemed to have, you know, just sort of sat there, was relaxed, looked quite happy. Do you think they got it about again. right? He, he was there and, and reasonably supportive, but not playing a prominent role. Does that feel about right? Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, he's not a working royal. Um, so we couldn't, we would not expect to see him on the balcony, which I think was absolutely right. Um, and, you know, he came, he saw, and he went back home again. So I think, you know... <laughs> There's so much written about him, which I find quite funny, but there wasn't really much to say. And I think people are trying to trying to milk those headlines. I mean, a lot of people talking about Princess Anne's hat and how Princess Anne was sitting right in front of It did obscure the view of him, didn't yes, it? Yes, she was wearing the blues yeah. and royals uniform and she had that red plume on her hat. And a lot of people were like, ooh, was she placed there deliberately? No, well, yeah, Princess maybe Anne doesn't maybe have time for that. he was happy to, to hide behind it. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but Ian, well, you wanted to talk particularly about the, the royal coach, which was spectacular. It was, yes. And I mean, that's um, the first time that's been used for a coronation, obviously, since, since 1953. Um, they obviously don't like it that much. <clears throat> the late Queen called it horrible. And Queen Victoria said it was um, distressing oscillations because the trouble is what happens is it's, it's not sprung. It's this great four-ton coach that's um, uh, gilded 
wood uh, that's base, uh, that sits on these enormous leather straps. So what happens is you've got eight horses push it, pulling you forward, so you've got that, that feeling of being pulled forward, but also you swing slightly to the side. Mm. So um, the sailor king William IV said it was like being at sea. <laughs> and, um, you know, you can imagine it's... it's uh, and it's so heavy that it can only go at a walking pace, which was actually mm. quite good because that gave you slightly more time to, uh, to see what was happening. And there's, there, there are shots of, of um, the royal couple leaving the abbey. They didn't go to the abbey in it. No, they, they went in, in the... The, the more modern Diamond Jubilee yeah. coach. Um, I think the, um, the slight pain with the Gold State coach, uh, built in 1762, is that um, you can't see very well through the windows. I mean, it wasn't designed to be seen in that way. And if you look at the, the footage you're showing, I mean, you, you can just see Charles at that angle, but mm. yeah. as he passes, that uh, bits of the coach are in the way. Yeah, it's very Disney princess, isn't it? It that, is, that, isn't that it? Coach. Definitely. Um, take us on um, now, Afia, to um, the sun on Sunday. This is, um, a, a, again, a, another spread, but uh, looking at the fashions, and there was yes. a lot of focus on, on the younger royals, wasn't there? Yeah, so the younger royals did very well yesterday. Um, but I thought what I thought was super cute is you had the Princess of Wales and Princess Charlotte were actually matching in this Alexander McQueen dress. So Princess Charlotte was wearing sort of a pared down uh, version of Kate's Alexander McQueen ivory silk cape gown. Uh, this was designed by Sarah Burton. It was embroidered with rose, shamrock, daffodil and thistle motifs to signify the four nations. And they had a silver headpiece, not a tiara, silver headpieces uh, created by milliner Jess Collette in conjunction with Alexander McQueen as well. And Kate was also wearing pearl and diamond earrings that belonged to Diana, Princess of Wales. Um, I thought they looked really really beautiful actually the whole family um and kate and charlotte matching is really really sweet i think it's great that they had the motifs of all the four nations on there as well but i think they're also uh, looking forward to a time where perhaps these pieces might go into a museum and they really wanted to give us sort of a vision or a piece of what it looked like at the beginning of the carolean age well, yeah yeah and so, so much symbolism and so much absolutely. detail from every last bit of embroidery yeah um it is quite extraordinary and it, was, the, it was quite funny watching yeah. Princess Anne because she had two roles. She was gold stick in waiting, so she, she had this uniform. But when yeah. she got there, she had to be a member of the royal family and put on these robes as well. Yeah. So we didn't see that happening, but it must have happened very quickly as she got off the horse. Yeah. It was brilliantly stage managed, the whole in. thing, wasn't it? It all looked very smooth. Um, and, and Ian, you've picked out a piece also in, in The Sun on Sunday um, of this... this rather poignant moment. I mean, there was so much formality and yet there was this, this family moment, if you like, when uh, Prince William kissed his father. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that, uh, he had the, the role of also putting his father's super, super tunica on, this um, golden um, coat that he put on before that. And you could see Charles saying thank you. And it was almost like role reversal, because when you're little, your mum does that to you. But uh, he was doing it back to him. And... Um, it was a very touching, emotional moment, I think. And it, I think, shows the, the closeness of father and son. And I, my prediction is that it's going to be a kind of a joint monarchy, that William will be involved in everything. And you actually saw it with the procession, because at the Queen's, the late Queen's coronation and previous ones, the King and Queen come in on their own, but they actually came in with... Um, the King and Queen came in with the Waleses, didn't they, in the procession? Yeah. So it's very much part of, you know, unified, I think. There's going to be a teamwork all round, I guess. Mm. Well, um, Ian and Afia, it's really lovely to have your company this morning, the morning after the night before, <laughs> yeah. here at Buckingham Palace, <laughs> uh, reflecting on the day yesterday. Thanks so, Thank so much. You.